Hello everybody, welcome to the new time of CS135. How's everybody doing? How was your weekend? I hope everybody's doing good. I hope you're all awake. You all chose a big radical change in the time, so here we are in the morning. So uh, everybody's awfully quiet, but we have some viewers, so then let's get started since we got quite a bit to cover. Uh, for starters, Assignments one and two were already due, and then assignment three will be what you will work on after finishing today. Yeah, good morning. You're all sleepy. Eh, at least you can all watch it like on bed or something. I have to like sit down and shower and everything. So, yeah. all right. So, um, yeah. So we're gonna learn about the if statement, and it's a very very important concept in programming. And uh, I can't understate how important this is. It's what's going to make your programs be actually interesting. So uh, before we can do that, though, we are going to talk about Boolean algebra. I'm going to introduce you to it, give you the basics of it, and then you will see how it gets applied into doing a conditional if statement. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right. So, Boolean algebra and logical expressions. If anybody has taken like a philosophy class, um, then they then you will know this. And if not, you might know it already. So, um, the most basic idea of Boolean algebra are statements and whether they are true or false. So, a statement can only be true or it can only be false. It cannot be uh, half true, half false. So, for example, a true statement could be something like, you know, it is 9 a.m. And this is a statement. And whether it's true or not is going to depend on what the time it is. Turns out right now that it's actually 9.02 a.m. Therefore, this statement is false, right? But if it was exactly 9 a.m., then the statement would be true. Okay, so when you start thinking about uh, the world as made up of statements and then being true or false, of course, we're talking about like a black and white world here, no gray lines, uh, because that's kind of what computers want. They want, you know, they don't want something gray line. They want it defined. When you start thinking about the world like that, then you can start to create sequences of other statements by combining multiple. So for example, this is one statement. It is 9 a.m. That's true or false, okay? Um, another statement could be, I am a student, okay? So, or, yeah. Okay? And maybe not just a student, but maybe I am a CS135 student. How about that? And yet again, this can be true or false, okay? And then um, you can chain these statements together to say, if it's 9 a.m., if that is true, and if I am a CS135 student, if that is also true, then I should attend the video lecture. However, if either of these statements is false, then I have another sort of solution, and that is, I sleep in, okay? And so, my logic is, if it's 9 a.m., if such a statement is true, and if I am a CS135 student, if that is true, then and only then, if those two things are true, then I will attend the video lecture. If either of those is false, then I'm going to sleep in. And I can even improve this and make it even more precise. I can also add a statement that says, it is Monday through Friday. Or actually, how about, let's, let's switch it up a little bit. It's not the weekend. This is a statement. However, I use the word not. 
So uh, you can go ahead and put something negative associated to a statement, right? So I can say it is not the weekend. And now I'm going to say that I'm only going to attend the video lecture if all of these three statements are true. And if any one of those is false, then I'm not going to attend and I'm going to sleep in. What can be a situation like that? Well, it could be 9 a.m. and I could be a student, but it could be Sunday. So I am sleeping in. Other scenario, it could be uh, 7 p.m. and I'm a CS135 student and it's Monday. However, I'm not going to attend the video lecture because it's 9 a.m. lecture. So I don't attend. In this case, I guess I'll sleep in at 7. Uh, other scenario, uh, it is 9 a.m. It is a Tuesday, which is not the weekend, but I'm not a CS135 student. I'm a CS202 student, or I'm just not taking that class. Maybe it's the fall right now, or it's the spring. You already took it. Therefore, you don't attend the lecture. So the idea of making a decision based on previous statements is the idea of doing Boolean logic. And uh, Boolean logic, and I have a picture here, so I'll put that up before I, before I forget. Uh, Boolean logic was made by, or not, yeah, I guess you could say made or introduced by George Boole. And you can see the, the, uh, the similarity in the name, right? Because Boolean, kind of like Newtonian versus Newton, or uh, yeah, like that. And so uh, he, uh, he's, pre he's, he's pretty famous. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and post this in case you want to read about it because it's not really a history class. But, uh, oh, I see you guys all did the extra credit thing. Cool. Uh, do send me on Discord your names so that I know who you are so I can add the, the points since I don't know because you guys are using nicknames who you are. So, uh, yes, make sure you do that. But anyways, so if you want to go and, re and, and read this link, you can uh, find out more about, about him. Uh, he lived in the 1800s. And it was a combination. It's not just one man that, that did everything. But in this case... Uh, he he sort of created the basic concept of Boolean logic, and then uh, it was Claude uh, Shannon who uh, eventually like took this concept from the 1800s and said, "Hey, this could be useful for uh, for computers and uh, and engineering in general." And so he he kind of applied it. So it's kind of like thinking uh, calculus is pretty useful for uh, for doing some things in machine learning, right? But when calculus was created, there was no such thing as machine learning. But somebody said, hey, this stuff is pretty useful for calculating that, you know. So that's kind of the same idea here. So, uh, yeah, so this is the, the guy. And this is a pretty nice introduction to Boolean logic as well. So you guys can check that out on your own time. I'm going to switch back to the uh, path, though. Okay, so I'm glad I showed that. So there we go. And there's a, just like a video as well. So I haven't seen the video, but I'm sure it's pretty good. Okay. So I'm um, going back to this. All right. So now let's uh, let's make it more abstract. Instead of listing statements here, let's consider these as variables. Okay. So let's call statement instead of statement one, two, or three. Let's just use A, B, and C. So this is statement A, statement B, and statement C. Right. And what I want is that a combination of A, B, and C, all of these being true, that goes ahead. And let's say this is going to be. Uh, Let's call this one D and this one E, okay? So when all of these three are true, we're gonna go ahead and do D. And otherwise, you know, we're gonna go ahead and do E, okay? And so what we need to do is, we need to figure out a notation to represent that. So say the idea of when everything is true, do this, and when everything is not, don't do it. So these are gonna be your basic operators in Boolean logic. And, and, and those, those are going to be three things. You have the AND operator, the OR operator, and the NOT operator, which is kind of like negation. Uh, in mathematics, they use a lot of symbols for these things. For example, one of the ones that I've seen used is a dot and a plus for AND and OR. Uh, another one that's very popular is kind of like an upside down B and a right side V. Uh, so they'll say something like, this means and, and then this one means or. Um, what other ones? Oh, but in C++, you'll find out that they also use the ampersand. And for the or, 
they used wow it like it left my mind for a second um, oh yeah the two vertical lines uh, these vertical lines in your keyboard are above the enter key it's the key that has the the not the backslash yeah actually that is the backslash yeah that's the backslash so the, the same key as the backslash has a vertical line on it like that so instead of holding shift with the backslash you uh, do that ampersand and be in philosophy so they mix and match because the ampersand is usually for and and so is the V so I don't know predicate logic flashbacks that's good that you guys have taken the philosophy stuff so this is not going to be as thorough as that but you're definitely going to have to get into this mentality of creating logic in your head and so okay so so I'm, I'm good I'm good so I'm not talking in the blind here you guys know uh, and now for the not there's a couple of symbols uh, there's that there's also like they'll put like a little line on top of a letter so like I guess I'll put a letter so if it's a they'll put a line there uh, and then in C++ there is the exclamation point okay uh, and then of course they also just use the words themselves too okay and, and in the case of C++ they do they just use the lower case at least for these two not for not Although some languages like Python, they use they do use the word not as actually a word, a way of negating it. Okay, so these three operations allow us to combine statements to generate this kind of logic. Where if these three things are true, we can do that. So uh, what I'm going to show you now is known as a truth table, and the truth table is basically uh, the rule set of how these operations should work. Right. So. If you could think about it, how, how the rule set is like saying, how does, how does addition work? Well, addition works by, well, that's, that's kind of tricky. Uh, it, it works by taking the two numbers and aggregating together. I don't know. It's kind of hard without using, using the word add together, right? But uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's going into a, a hole that I can't get. How do they teach that to people in like kindergarten or elementary school? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's just a, you put them together. I don't know. Okay. Moving on from that black hole, black hole of area that we don't want to go into, uh, you will learn though about some hardcore things like actually how how and why addition is what it is. And like if you take a math two fifty one, I think it is, um, and they do like a proof of basic things that make you question things. But anyways, so I'll let them deal with that kind of stuff. But here, let's just talk about truth tables. So again, I'm going to go ahead and create two statements. I'm going to say A and B. Okay. And I know, I know I have up here A, B, and T. This is a different A and B, okay? So this is a statement A and statement B. You can say statement one and statement two, okay? And so in the case of AND and OR, these are binary operators, okay? Binary just like addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, okay? Uh, whereas the NOT op uh, operator is a unary operator, and that's kind of like a negative, like when you say negative five. Or when you're using an exponent, that's also a unary operator. Uh, actually, that, that, that could be argued as a binary, actually, because you could say that the exponent is the right-hand side. But uh, at least the, the negation is. Or in C++, when you were talking about pre- and post-increment and that kind of thing. Okay, So this, is, this one's a unary. So this is binary, and then this is unary. Okay? And so let's... Uh, well, I guess we can actually look at the not first, because that one is simple. So if I have a statement A... And I apply the not to that, so I can put that in front of it. Then that is going to become uh, the opposite of that. So if statement A was true, now it's going to become false. And if statement A was originally false, now it's going to become true. Okay. And and the way we represent that in the little tiny truth table is we can say. Um, 0, 1, or T and F. Um, I guess I'll use 0 and 1 because we're, we're programmers. But you could also use T and F to stand for true or false. You can think of this as like the before and after. Okay? So, if before we had a, a, a false statement and, and we applied the not to that, then now we're going to have a true statement. And if we have a true statement and we apply the not to that, we're going to have a false statement, okay? And that kind of makes sense. That's like saying, I like cookies. And then I say, not. Like, I don't like cookies, I guess, you know? Uh, or like, 
well, if we come back to the ones that I listed here, I'm kind of using that it's not the weekend. So I can reward this and saying it's the weekend. And then I can put a not in front of that, and now I've negated it into it's not the weekend. Okay? So uh, that's going to be basically the not true table. Now let's look at the and and or. The and is going to be used whenever you want to guarantee that something is only going to evaluate to true if both, because it's binary, left and right, operands, if both of them are true. Only then. Otherwise, it's false. Whereas the OR operator, it's kind of like one or the other. So if at least one of them is true, then it evaluates to true. Okay? So let's go ahead and put in the AND. So for the AND, we have, you can think of it like the left and then the right operands. And then what it evaluates to. So, we can have four possible combinations. We can have them both be false. We could have the right one being false and then the left one being true. I guess that's this one. Or we could have the left one being false and the right one being true. Or the fourth scenario is both the left and the right are true. So these are the four combinations. These are different because we're saying that in this case, the right side is true and the left side is false. So it's like, it's not the weekend versus like, uh, or sorry, this would be like, it's not the weekend versus it is 9 a.m. Okay, that kind of thing. And so, what are these going to evaluate to? Well, they're all going to evaluate to false with the exception of the last one. Because because only time when you end something together and it evaluates to true is when both the left and right side are true. So how would I write this? I would say A and B, or I could say A and V, um, and uh, what were the other symbols? So I had the ampersand, A and V, and did I have any other ones? Uh, nope, I think, I, oh, the little dot. Yeah, I've seen the dot used before. Okay, so these are, th these are basically going to be uh, how you would represent that. And you would evaluate it based on what it is. Okay, so if A is true and B is false, then you're going to be looking at this line right here. However, if A and B are both true, then you're going to be looking at the bottom line there. Okay, so that's going to be your AND. Now, OR is going to be the same table, but different results on the uh, evaluation side. So we've got, again, this, the four possible combinations that you could have, like that. And then in this case, again, we could say this is like the left op, and then this is the right operate operand, and then this is what it evaluates to. In this case, OR will evaluate to true if any of them are true. So it's going to evaluate to true if both are true, just like AND. But unlike AND, um, and in either of these scenarios, we have something that's true. And because we have something that's true on either one, then we're going to evaluate to true. The only time that AND is not going to evaluate to true is if both are false. Okay? Uh, be careful because sometimes, I mean, in English, it makes sense because you're like, uh, I am happy if I have a cat or if I have a dog. That's kind of how OR works. Uh, vice versa or not vice versa but under the hand if i'm using and it's like i am happy if i have food and i have a house i'm saying that I, if, if i don't have either of those then i'm not happy okay so it makes sense on the first sort of thought with english but there's a lot of times when we're speaking and we use the words and and or and interchange them and we're not following the same logic as we would if we're talking like Boolean logic, okay? Uh, it's tricky to come up with an example like that, but uh, I don't like eating cheese and... Uh, I'm trying to think of what I don't like eating. And, and, I don't like, and I don't like drinking wine. How about that? I like eating cheese and I don't like drinking wine, okay? So the way you're saying, saying that you're saying you don't like cheese and you don't like wine, right? In fact, I even use the word and in there. You don't like cheese and you don't like wine. However, 
what you may really be trying to say is if either of those foods are present in your meal, then you're not going to be happy. Okay. So what I'm trying to get to with this is be careful because when you're thinking about your logic in your head, uh, you might be thinking in the English language where sometimes it's a little bit ambiguous when we use the word and an or. And with logic, you have to be very, very careful because or means that as long as any of the things that you're saying in the list, if at least one of them is true, then the whole statement evaluates to true. Oh, sorry, I hit the mic. I don't know if that was loud. Whereas with and, we're saying everything must be true. Okay? So, yeah. Unfortunately, there's no easy trick for me to tell you how to just burn this in your mind other than practice. So you're just gonna have to practice these things. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a little bit of, of examples of this, okay? So let's go ahead and start with the example that we had up here, okay? So we wanna go ahead and convert this into Boolean logic. So we can say, we have statements A, B, and C, and those were the three of them. Um, this was 9 a.m. Uh, this was student. And then this we're just going to call it it's weekend. We're going to room the word not just so I can show you the example of using not. Okay. So if I want to evaluate this, I can say, uh, I'm going to say if this evaluates to true, then I take class. If it evaluates to false, then I don't take the class. I said I don't watch the lecture. Okay. So if true, watch lecture, else not watch lecture, okay? So I'm gonna write that by saying A and B and not C, okay? Because I need A and B to be true, because it has to be 9 a.m., it has to be the uh, 135, but it cannot be the weekend, okay? So it's not the weekend. I can also use this with the other notation. I can say A and B and not C, okay? Like that. And then if this evaluates, then I will know whether I have to watch the, uh, the lecture or not, okay? So uh, let me go ahead and give you a combination of statements. So I'm going to say A and B or C. Let me stick to one type of, I was trying to go with different ones to familiarize you, but I feel like that's going to just make you confused. So I'm going to stick with the ampersand one because that's the closest it is to EC++. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that. and D. Okay, so here I got a combination of letters. Now I'm going to ask you a, qu a question here. Okay, what combination of letters can I have in this statement? As in, what, which of these var uh, variables have to be true and which of them have to be false so that the entire expression here evaluates the true? So, what does A, B, C, and D, what do they have to be set to so that the entire expression here evaluates the truth? And of course, you have 50-50 chance on each of them, right? So, and there may be more than one answer. Okay, so you, you are already in the right path and there's something I didn't quite mention yet, but I think you guys have already kind of got a hint of that. And that is order of operations. Remember in math, addition comes after multiplication, right? You gotta multiply and then you gotta add. When, when you come to and and or, there's a certain hierarchy of that. And the hierarchy is the most important operation that you have to do first to a variable is the not operation. So, because it's unary. So you got to do that before you do anything else. After that, you got to do the and operation. So you got to do any ending and at the bottom of the priority is going to be the or. 
which I think you guys were, when you were doing those guesses already, you were taking into consideration. But it's important. A lot of people uh, miss this, okay? Uh, I don't want to call them out, but there were, there were some people in the, in, the, in the faculty, in the department who, who like I told them this and they were like, nah, that's not true. And then he checked it up and yeah, there's a certain order of operation that uh, holds and people didn't know. Because otherwise, you it, logic would get messed up if, if there was different ways. And that's actually why I kind of like remembering um, these symbols for, uh, for, for Boolean logic because the plus looks like an addition and the dot is another uh, example of multiplication that you usually do because dot product. And so you can, if you do your Boolean logic like that, it's very easy to remember that the dot goes before the plus when you're doing your operations. So if you do something like uh, a dot b plus c, you know that you have to do this first and then you go ahead and do that. And of course, if you had a dot b plus c like this, first you do the not, then you do the uh, multiplication, which is the and, and then you do the or, which is the addition, okay? So anyways, now back to our question. We had one person say at least one has to be true. Well, yes, that is, that's, that is a true statement, but that's not the entire story because that's not giving me the answer, right? Uh, so let's see what other person said. Other person said A and B or C and D have to be true. Okay, A and B have to be true or C and D have to be true. That is correct. Uh, so within that, just give me the values that you th that you think would make this. And as you can see, because either of these can be true, there's going to be more than one answer. So go ahead and just throw me values for A, B, and C, and D, of what you think would evaluate this to true. And it should be relatively obvious. For those of you that take philosophy, for at least. So how do I make this true? And how do I make this true? And again, there's more than one answer, so I'm going to... List at least that much. I think that will, that will take care of that. So what does A and B and C and D have to be? True or false? So we got A true, B true, C false, and D false. Yep. So that will indeed evaluate to true. And then the, the other possible scenario uh, would be that we could have that. We could have A and B be false and C and D be true. We could also have a couple of more scenarios. We could have a scenario where everything is true and that will also evaluate to true. We could also have a bunch of uh, zigzags. So we could have like one, one, zero, one or one, 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 zero. That will evaluate to true. Or we can play around with this side. We could do that or we could do that. All of these will evaluate to true. Okay, so A true, B true, C true, D false. Yeah, so that would be uh, this one, the one that you listed. So as you can see, there's more than one answer. Okay, uh, so does is that what we want though? Is is that a scenario that we want? Do we? It, what are we trying to do here? Like, are, are, is is it is it a situation where we're saying what could be a, an application of this? Let's. Let's say that uh, that you're trying to decide if you, uh, again, maybe if you were watching the lecture, okay? So if you're watching the lecture, we can say that the statement A is it's 9 a.m. and statement B is that uh, you're a student, okay? So that's one reason to watch the lecture. On the other side, we got C and D. Maybe in C and D are completely different things. Maybe. C is you're on the Discord channel, and D is you've taken a class from me before. And maybe there's people that want to watch it because they because because they've taken a class and they're stopping by. And we've had people do that every single day since, since I started the lectures. So this could be a situation where either of those will make you go watch the lecture. Okay. So this is sort of like the reverse engineering of figuring out when something evaluates to true. But what you as a programmer typically will do is the other way around. You will need to create these logic, uh, these Boolean expressions, as they're called, uh, to decide on your logic of what you're trying to accomplish. So, if you're trying to say, um, for example, let's say you're trying to make a program that decides uh, what you want to do with your day. Like, if you want to... Uh, Wash clothes.
watch TV or uh, visit your parents. Okay, so these are the three options that you're trying to make your program help you decide. It's like a kind of like a like a schedule program, like it make, figures out your schedule. Okay, but here's the thing: for you to wash clothes, clothes have to be dirty. And you have to have free time. On the other hand, you only watch TV if, again, you have free time. And your clothes are not dirty. Clothes not dirty. And maybe no homework. You have no homework. Okay? Visiting your parents, on the other hand, the clothes part's irrelevant. You don't care whether your clothes are dirty or not. But you do have to have free time. And it doesn't matter if, uh, or not say you, you have to have no homework either. And here's the thing. If we just leave it like this, we have a bit of a logic issue. Because uh, if you leave it like this, then... You could either watch your TV or visit your parents at this point, right? So you could do that, but then you just combine them. You can say that you both watch TV and visit your parents, or better yet, we have to do something else to decide. So uh, maybe uh, you miss your parents. That's actually your thing, miss parents. Okay? So now we have our possible uh, sort of rules to decide on what we want to do, okay? So let's go ahead and designate variables to these. So, Let's go ahead and say clothes dirty. That is going to be C because it makes sense because clothes. Free time or has free time. I guess have is the right conjugation of the verb. We're going to say F for that. And then whether you have homework or not, we're just going to convert it into a positive. So have homework. We're gonna make that an H. And what else do we have? We have close dirty, free time, not dirty, homework, uh, miss parents. Now you have to decide, do, does miss parent affect anything between watch TV or watch clothes? Because it's not part of your decisions, it doesn't matter. That means that it doesn't matter whether you miss them or not. If you have dirty clothes, it means you're gonna end up doing uh, you're watching clothes so you could put both cases whether it's true or false but you can just leave it leave it outside okay so let's go ahead and generate the sequence of boolean uh, statements here that would result if an evaluation is true in you washing clothes okay so what combination of boolean logic here is going to make us wash clothes what combination is going to make us watch TV and what combination is going to make us visit parents all right so let's go ahead and start with the wash clothes for that clothes have to be dirty so that means C has to be there and it has to be positive C and you have to have free time okay so C and F for free time on the other hand, you have to, um, for watching TV, you have to have free time. And you have to have clothes not dirty. So not C. And no homework. Is homework not in the first one at all? Nope, it's not. Okay. And no homework. Okay, what do I have for visit parents? What do I have to do for that one? You guys tell me. It's hot. Oh, by the way, ah, that's why the quality is so bad. I forgot to turn my lights on. Sorry. There we go. It's a little bit better now. 
So F for free time, yes. And then no home no homework. That's good too. However, do I put an or or an and between the F and the homework? And for miss them, oh we never put a letter for that, so I'll put an M for that. And now what if I wanted to switch it so that if you miss it, it doesn't matter whether you have homework or free time. If you miss them, you will go regardless. How can I switch this to make it so that it doesn't matter if I have free time or homework? I will just want to go to my parents if I miss them. What about M? What am I going to do to this to change it so that I go to my parents regardless about my free time or homework? If I miss them, I just want to go. It doesn't matter if I have homework or if I have free time. I just want to go no matter what, the moment I miss them. Use the OR statement. Yes, that's right. Use the OR statements. Very good. Okay. So now you run into a different into another situation here. Suppose that you're really, really growing sad about your parents because you miss them a lot. And you want to make sure that here's the thing. If you have dirty clothes, right? And you have free time. This chain says that I should wash my clothes. But what if I want to make sure that even though I have clothes dirty and free time, I want to make sure I don't end up washing clothes because I want to make sure that I go visit parents. How can I modify this statement here to ensure that I don't actually wash clothes if I if I miss my parents? That way, because I have to I have to go in a certain order through this expression, right? I can't just magically go to visit parents. So I'm gonna say that I'm gonna go from top to bottom, which means that I'm gonna check my wash clothes first, and I'm gonna check for watch TV, and then I'm gonna check for visit parents. Because here's the thing. Uh, right now, it's impossible for me to wash clothes if what I wanted was to watch TV, because I have the C. And the C on one of them is true, and the other one is false, which means that I can't ever run into a situation where I could have both washed clothes and watched parents, and depending on which one I decided to pick first, then they would change. But those are very, very independent of each other. Visit parents is not, because visit parents has the same um, sort of rule set as watching TV, because both but watch TV and visit parents require me to have free time and require me to have no homework. Or there's also a scenario where if I just miss them, I go. There is an extra constraint though for watching TV that says that uh, that I have to have no dirty clothes. But if I have no dirty clothes and I have free time and I have no homework, I could end up watching both TV and visiting parents. So what if I want to make sure that I never, I, I'm a very indecisive person. So I want to make sure that I never I, I run into a situation where my scheduler doesn't tell me what to do. So what can I add to, to watch TV or potentially to wash clothes to make it independent though, to make sure that, that it only chooses one. So for example, I could throw in the, the missing parents variable. Maybe I only watch TV if I don't miss my parents. That way it separates it from the other one. So how can I do that? How can I throw in the missing parents in there? And how can I do the same thing for washing clothes? Because otherwise, if I miss parents right now, and even though I have dirty clothes and free time, I wanna make sure that I visit parents. So what can I do to both of these statements to guarantee that if I miss parents, I will go visit parents. I have to add an and or an or to either of these. Any guesses?
choose and or M for wash clothes all right so we have an and so I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, you can definitely put the and here but you have to put not M because you don't have to miss parents there and here you're saying or M or M is not gonna work there because here's the thing if I put or M there that's just telling me that if I miss my parents I'm gonna end up washing clothes so you're like oh okay then I can flip it like that doesn't matter if I use or there I'm still gonna end up washing clothes if I have if I have dirty clothes and free time so that's not really gonna work there you can't really use or here you have to use an and as well because then now it's not going to uh, to go in here if I miss parents because if I miss parents this is going to evaluate to false which means the entire statement is going to evaluate to false which means you're never gonna end up washing clothes on the other side here it's kind of a similar situation if uh, I have a free time and I have no dirty clothes and uh, I have no homework and I'm not missing my parents then I watch TV and you have to use a man there so anyways this is just an example of how logic can get very complicated and you could have a combination of 20 different statements with a mixture of and and ors and uh, you would essentially uh, just be get kind of touching the surface of this uh, boolean logic is how your computer is implemented at the smallest level or the lowest level in your computer when we're talking about binary your computer can do the things it can do because of something known as transistor and transistors are nothing more than logic gates I created a transistor that is going to represent an AND or an OR table or a NOT and that's it if I have these three little transistors that can do one of these operations and by that I'm saying in the in the level of transistors the ones in binary are represented it, first of all you do it by little cycles so you have a, a sort of a clock that, that that sends a shock per se every uh, every fraction of a second and it's a defined uh, time which is actually what the clock cycle is in your computer when they say like 1.5 gigahertz or whatever 3.1 gigahertz that's going to be your uh, your clock okay so if every one of these ticks if your computer receives re receives a one that rep or sorry if it receives electricity that is considered a one which is considered true if there's no electricity that clock tick then it represents a zero or a false and what your transistor would do is if I put a not transistor in there and I receive a one dot clock then I'm not gonna output anything on the other hand if I receive nothing and it's a, it's a not transistor, then it's going to now all of a sudden output electricity. Okay, this is of course like connected to some current so that they can flow it in. In in this in the scenario where we have two little wires coming in into like a little breadboard, and then in this case, both of, if we're using an AND logic gate. So the transistor, if it receives current on both of these in that clock tick, then it's going to output current. But if it only receives current from one of the sides of here, then it's not going to output any current. It has to come from both sides. On the other hand, if it's an OR uh, logic gate, then that one is actually easy to think about. You just go ahead and, and hook, hook up a wire here and then just two wires like this and you just kind of tie them together, right? And as long as either of these wires has current in it, then the current will keep flowing. Okay, that one's kind of easy to think about with an or. The, the tricky one is going to be the and. Because the and, you're only going to let current flow if current is coming from both sides. The not is, um, you know, you have to find a way of detecting the current. And if there's current, then you turn it off or vice versa. Okay. So, transistors have these logic gates in them. And if you chain all of these logic gates together, you can create far more advanced things. Like for example, you can create a calculator. You can create addition with just a combination of AND, OR, and NOT gates. So 
if I make a really complicated and statement and or statement with, with, with nots and ands in there, I can make a multiplexer and I can make a little calculator that can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all of these things in binary, which then I can convert into uh, into into decimal and connect it to like a little LED, which turns on specific spots of a little, uh, you know, if you've seen the old school clocks, they're made up of like little lights. like this, right? And depending on which lights you turn on, it's a number. So like if you want to do nine, then you turn these lights on. But if you want to do, for example, uh, one, then you only turn these two lights on and you leave the rest off. Like you only turn these two on, that's a one, okay? And, and, and so, for example, if you want to do 31, you know, bam, you got 31 in there like that. Well, actually, well, I guess this one's drawn, so we don't draw this one, okay? So you can display things like this. And it turns out that you just keep adding more logic gates, more transistors in there, and you can make more complicated tasks up until we get to the point that you have a computer that is fully working. But at the heart of that computer, all it is is a bunch of transistors. How many? I don't even want to say a number because I would be wrong, but it is definitely in the millions or plus or higher they they've gotten so small that each transistor is in the nanometers uh width and they keep getting smaller there's there's certain limitations on how small you can get but we reach to the point where we're running into quantum physics and problems with that uh that limit uh, the size of this because here's the thing the the um Electricity is electrons, right? And these electrons have to flow through a cable, right? The smaller this gets and the thinner it gets, the wall of these cables get, is that it gets to the point where there's like one atom, atom width of a wall. And you start getting all these quantum effects where like atoms just, uh, electrons just randomly go through walls. Like they just literally phase through them. And it's like, what? There's a wall there. It just magically phase through. Yes, that's quantum physics. Go watch a documentary on, on, on like a science channel for that. But uh, there's a certain limitation to how small we can get, which is why computers have kind of slowed down in terms of how fast they've been getting in the past few years, because they're finding ways of trying to, to avoid these kind of problems, but we've reached to that point where that's how small we can get. And the more transistors we have, the more computing power we have. And, uh, but, but you still have to fit them in the same amount of space, so they have to keep getting smaller. And so that's one of the things. But anyways, that's besides the point. Do not underestimate the, these logic gates, and or or not. Because the fact that they're here, and that, that, that's why they said, uh, the, 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 you know, the guy that created Boolean, George Bull, that he's such an important person in computer, in computer science and, and engineering all things, because if it wasn't for that Boolean logic, none of your computers would work. And, if it, and, and then all of that is based off of these, gate, of these gates. You can create super complicated circuits based on just these three rules. From these, you create other two tables, which are like the XOR, uh, NAND, but they're still just made up of AND and OR. So you can create a calculator and so on. If you take CPU 100, this, the lab specifically, you do a couple of projects where you where you do these things. So uh, I'm not expecting you in this class to be able to, to create an entire computer simulated with just a bunch of logic gates, uh, but you are expected to familiarize yourself with how to create specific logic and how to convert your plain English logic into Boolean logic because, as you're going to see in a second, that's how if statements work and that's how control flow works in a program. So let's actually start talking about control flow, okay? So, control flow, I think it's uh, chapter four, let me see. No, it's uh, seven actually, chapter seven. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first is known as sequential control flow. And that's because it starts from the top and goes in order all the way to the bottom. There are some computers and there's some concepts where like it doesn't matter what you execute. It's like you have a bunch of code and it just picks a line at random and runs that code. You know, that, that's just the way that works. That's not what we're doing here. Programming in C++ starts from the top 
and goes to the bottom and it goes line by line. It doesn't just decide to start all of a sudden in the bottom, right? And that matters when you're creating your, your logic because the way in C++ that you're coding is you have a statement and then you have another statement and then you have another statement and so on. And they're always going to be executed in that order from top to bottom, okay? In the order that they're placed in the program. And that's how you've been running your program so far. Assignments one and two was basically that. You did some code at the beginning, it ran through the code, you finish, it closed the program, you were done. That's not very exciting. When we get to loops, you'll see how to wrap around. We're still gonna go from that start to end, but now, instead of running every single piece of code that you write, we're only gonna run specific pieces of code that are relevant to what we're doing, and other pieces may not run. So instead of having this sort of linear sequence of statements, we're gonna add the power of choice. So instead, we're gonna reach sort of a Y division in the row. We're gonna call this assertion. I shouldn't have stopped after writing the first three letters. But okay, all right? We're gonna ask a question to the program with Boolean logic, surprise, surprise. And if that Boolean logic evaluates to true, we're gonna take the left path. If it evaluates to false, we're gonna take the right path. It's kind of like uh, if you think of the movie, The Matrix, and you have Morpheus and he offers him, they wanna take the blue pill or the red pill, right? The, uh, what is it, like the, the red pill takes you down the rabbit hole and the blue pill makes you wake up the next in your bed, right? And you have the choice, and Neil has that choice, right? He takes the red pill and for the better or the worst, he goes down that path. And of course the movie pretty much would end if he took the blue pill. So it's kind of expected for him to take that. But uh, yeah, so if, the, if he had taken the blue pill, you know, the movie would have been completely different. He may have never even ever like woken up from the matrix and whatnot, right? But he took the red pill, which basically led to the entire movie's plot and two sequels. And now there's a matrix four coming out next year. So yeah. You know, all because of a single choice. That's what you're doing here. You're giving the, the user a choice. And based on his choice, then you're going to do something. You're going to, for example, run statement A. Or you're going to run statement B. So before, you were just going choice sequence by sequence by sequence. You're just, it's kind of like you're just watching a movie. You're not taking a place in that. It's just happening in front of you. But now you're interacting with it, and now you're going to make a choice. And after you do a bunch of these statements, it's possible that the program may come back together and run more sequential code. Whether this code was affected by the if statement is, is, is up to the, uh, the program, it's, but it may or may not be. But at least this part was, because this was only ran when the lab evaluated true. And on the other hand, this was only ran when it evaluated to false, OK? So that's going to be how uh, conditionals work in your program. Now, how do I actually create the assertion? Like, how do I write that Boolean logic in C++? Well, you're going to use a Boolean expression. And for that, I'm going to introduce you to a new data type a built-in data type, and that is going to be the bool, okay? The bool data type. The bool data type is uh, a variable that you can declare. You can declare a variable, so you can just say bool, uh, I don't know, bar equals, or you can just, well, you can just declare it like this, and then you can uh, you can assign it to something. And the two things that you can assign it, and these are reserved words in C++, actually bool is also a reserved word. So now you're gonna hear three new reserved words. Bool is one of them. And then the other two are gonna be true and false. And they're all lowercase like this. Some languages like to uppercase, like the T and the F, C++, it's lowercase. So there you go, three reserved words that you've learned. and so. As you can guess, if you have a Boolean variable, 
it's sort of representing whether a statement you're giving is true or false, right? If you are, uh, if we're thinking back to the example about the class, your variable could be called it's 9 a.m. And you're gonna set that to true because it's 9 a.m. And then I'm student, maybe you set that to false because you're not a student, okay? So you could do something like that. Just make sure you add the data type in front. And so now you learn how to create uh, a Boolean variable that represents a Boolean expression, or not just a Boolean expression actually, but a Boolean statement. That's my, that's a better way of saying it. yes, Boolean statement. Okay, it can represent an expression once you actually assign it based on an expression. But I, before you do that, it's just a statement. So yes, how do we actually give it some meaning? Well, let's go ahead and and and, uh, and create a, a Boolean called uh attend class and we're going to initialize it to false we're not attending class but now we're going to do what we did earlier which is we're only going to attend class if these two things are true so we're going to update it and say attend class gets and by the way i guess this is a terminology that i haven't i, I may have not mentioned to you before uh, i did definitely make a spiel about the equal sign being different than the one in, in uh, math right uh, the other thing about it is is because to avoid confusion we if we have something like uh, uh this right here you don't say bar equals true you want to say bar gets true so that avoids confusion um, between our math colleagues and, and us here by not using the word equals when you're talking about assignment operator. And so you could say bar assi gets assigned true, that's too long, so we just say bar gets true. Uh, if you're just talking about like a normal variable, like int a equals five, you don't say int a equals five. You say int a gets five, okay? Or int a is assigned five. So when you see me, when you hear me say the word gets, that's what it means, okay? And, and you'll see in a second, because now we're gonna have equality in uh, Boolean logic. So in that one, we do want to use the word equals, but you'll see in a second, okay? So anyways, we're gonna say attend class gets, it's 9 a.m. and I'm student. So attend class will get the value of true if and only if these two things are true, right? Because otherwise, Assuming that this is what the AND operator is in C++, which it is, uh, that's what's happening. Although in this case, because AND student is false, it's going to turn out that a 10 class will get false because both of them are false, right? So, okay. Before I go any further, let me go ahead and tell you what the uh, Boolean operators, which actually the correct name for them is relational operators. And their operators used to compare values, okay? Which you'll see is actually more than just uh, Boolean stuff. So let me go ahead and list them. You have the less than, less than or equal to, you have greater than, greater than or equal to, and then the Boolean ones is not equal to, and equal equal and then I guess I'll throw in here you also have your logic ones which are those the end and or which is I, I told you a little bit earlier about okay so these are math ones okay these four at least that's uh, when you're saying like five is greater than six you know you could say or five is less than six I suppose five is less than six uh, I could say a is less than or equal to x that means that if a is equal to 5 that means that uh, x has to be 5 or greater okay uh, notice the order of this okay you first put the less than and then you put the equal sign don't flip them it won't work like that you have to follow this specific syntax it's a syntax rule and finally you see this one this is actual equality from from math you use two equal signs. There's no space, by the way, in any of these. So like these two are these two are, are together, connect them. 
Same with the two equals, connect them. Uh, it's just, it's, it's two characters, but it represents one, one operator or one symbol in that. Okay? And so, um, if you go ahead and say something like this. Bool A gets five uh, less than six. What's going to happen is A is going to get the value of true because five is less than six. However, if I put here five is less than four, then A would get the value of false because that's a false expression. Right? But we value this to false. Okay. Any questions? All right, I'll keep going then. Cool. Um, I guess maybe the questions come, we'll see, because I don't know how, how big of a delay there is on the stream. So, uh, okay. So if, if we want to use the logic stuff, the Boolean stuff, we can use the ampersand and the or. Oh, I suppose the not as well. So if I have bool g gets a and b or c, then depending on how that evaluates, the result of the evaluation is going to be stored into G. So if A is true and B is false, but C happens to be true, then this will evaluate to true and G will have true to it, okay? By the way, in C++, if you, um, if you try to assign any value that's not a zero to, to uh, or in fact, well, yeah, if you try to assign any value that's not a zero to a Boolean, it's going to set it as true. The only time that, uh, some, that, that in C++ something is considered false is if it contains the number zero. So it's very possible that if you do something like, like bool g gets v, and v is an integer which contains 55, and you set g to that integer, g is a boolean, it's just going to set it to true. The only way you can set something to false is by having zero. So that means that every other possible number that you could have in there or value is going to make this Boolean true. The only time you can make it false is zero. Okay, so that's something important to know. Let me see if there's something else that I want to mention. Um... what else yeah this is a good one so if you're trying to compare with greater than or less than uh, with numbers I think it makes sense you all know what's bigger number than the other one but what if you draw in other data types so suppose you're comparing cars okay so if, if I have two cars and for this maybe it might be better if I code it because then you can actually see it happen and then you know it's not like a you can believe me. So, the obvious ones, you know, we got a bool b, and then we say bool b 5 is less than 6, okay? And then we can see out b. You can see a 1 there. That 1 represents true. Okay, if I go ahead and flip the sign around, or maybe you just flip the numbers, put 15 there, run it again, I get a zero. Because now this is false. And when it's false, it puts out a zero. When it's true, it puts out a one. Internally, you know, internally, I can go ahead and do something like true. But when you actually see out it, you just get the number. You don't get the word true. If you want to do the word true, then we'll talk about how to actually print that out once we talk about the if statement, okay? But uh, here's some of the weirder ones that you, you might get a little confused about. Let's say we have a car, C1 and car C2, okay? Now C1 is gonna contain the letter A, or maybe the letter G. And then C2 is gonna contain the letter T, okay? If I say bool B gets C1 less than C2, 
So it's going to evaluate to true if g is less than t. Okay, let's see what happens, and then we can talk about it. It said it's true. What does it mean? It's not comparing numbers, it's com comparing letters. But here's the thing, remember, these letters are stored in the ASCII table as numbers. And it happens to be that the g appears before the t, therefore, g is going to be less than t. Cool. Let's go ahead and try g in lowercase t. Same thing. You get 1. So you're saying g is yet again less than t. Okay, cool. So then, by that logic, what do you think is the output of this? Lowercase g and uppercase t. Am I going to also get... Since, I mean, I did try a lowercase t and an uppercase g, and it gave me true. So if I just flip them around, do you think this is going to also uh, tell me it's true? What do you guys think? you think it's going to be false? Ah, I press control S, which, which zooms out. Oh, dang it. Hold on a second. How's that? Is that... Is that readable? Or who oh, I, I think I distorted it for a second. Sorry guys. I guess I control S like resets the zoom of this. Is that uh is that readable? Can you guys all see that? Is that big like is that or is that, is that too big or is that good? Yes? Okay. Cool, cool. I gotta make sure I don't do that again. Alright. So uh okay. So we got uh, some people said false, some people said true. It turns out that it's false. And you're like, wait, what? But G goes less than T. Well, yeah, but look back at the ASCII table. Let me, let me pop that open real fast. Here we got our ASCII table. And notice that we have our G here, which is 71. And we also have our T, which is 84, which makes sense on why the G is less than the T. However, Remember that in the ASCII table, you first get all the uppercase letters, and then you get the lowercase letters. So if we compare G, uppercase G to lowercase T, yeah, of course, 70, uh, 71 is way less than uh, 116. However, if I'm comparing 84, which is the uppercase T, with the lowercase G, which is way after, that's 103. So that's why that evaluates to false. Because if you ever compare any uppercase letter with a lowercase letter, the uppercase letter is always going to go first because of how it's listed on the ASCII table. So uh, be careful about that. I have seen some sort of no bias mistakes is forgetting that that's a thing and then you're like confused on what's happening. If you ever want to try to just compare letters, make sure they're either both uppercase or both lowercase. There's the same casing. Okay, so that covers cars. The other scenario is with strings. Strings gets a little nasty. It's a very uh, typical error for new programmers to make. Let's put cat and let's put cow. Same thing. We're going to compare cat and cow. However, because it's strings, you have to use the double quotation marks. Somebody asked me over the weekend that they, their, their, code, their code coloring was not working. And they had to code something like this. Uh, and then and they were asking what's wrong with the color coding. If your color coding breaks when you're writing in visual code, it's because you have a syntax error. And you can confirm this by trying to compile your program and seeing it. But wherever the color coding breaks, that's probably where the syntax error is. And when you fix it, the color coding gets fixed as well. So that's just a, a nice little tip. All right, let's go ahead and run this. And it evaluates to true. So it's saying cat comes before a cow. What does changing car to string do? We are completely creating brand new uh, variables. A car contains a single character. A string contains a array of characters. Now, you don't know yet what an array is, but you can think of them as a list of characters, so multiple characters. If you're frozen, refresh, yes. <laughs> but yeah, of course you can't hear me if, if I'm frozen, so yeah. But anyways, so, a string is going to be a group of characters, a list of characters in a specific order, whereas a car is just one character, okay? So, here we're comparing two strings. We have cat and we have cow. And we compare them using a less than sign, which is dangerous. And we've got 
the fact that it's true. It is saying that the word cat comes before cow. It turns out that the way it's doing it, it's it's kind of comparing it alphabetically. And what it does is it compares the first letter of both strings, which happens to be a C, and it says, well, they're both C, so I can't really make a difference. It's going to go by the ASCII table again. But in this case, with the ASCII table, they're both the same. It looks at the second letter. There's an A and there's a no. Now there's a deviation. Because there's a deviation in the ASCII table, the lowercase a comes before the lowercase o. That's why it says that cat comes before cat. Okay? So uh, you could have something like this. Or maybe not that. Like D. And it would still say that cat comes before D. Because it's looking just at the first letter. Okay? So is this how you want to compare words? I don't know. All I'm trying to tell you is beware. This doesn't just kind of work like a, like a, as, as, as normal as you would think. It's comparing the column by column until it finds a difference. And again, you'll still have problems if it's a mixture of uppercase and lowercase or spaces or things like that. This will only work based on the ASCII table. So just be careful about comparing strings because weird things can happen. Um, there are other better ways of comparing strings. So that's that. Uh, this works with, with floats and doubles as you'd expect it to. Uh, equality also works. So I could say, uh, let's, 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 let's do the equality with the string. Yeah, why not? So, uh, C1 and C2. Let's go ahead and actually set them both to be cat. This tells me that it's true. C1 and C2 are equal. Now, if we go ahead and, and, and move this to, uh, to cow, it gets me zero. Cool. So in both of these scenarios, uh, it, is, it is comparing the contents of this and telling me. Now, I'm going to show you an error that tons of people love to make. Not because, actually, they reward. They don't love to make it. They probably hate that they make it, but they make it a lot. The very popular error of doing this, instead of putting two equal signs, they go ahead and put one. You know, and before this was false, right? Cat and cow are not equal. Ah, and this one had warned us. So I couldn't get away with doing it because it actually gave us a, a warning saying it cannot convert. C1 to bool initialization. Ah, because it's initialization. So here, let's try. Let's let me try uh let's try to do that and see what happens. See if let's compile. Nah, I still listen to us. Dang. Still, this is a very, very popular error people make. Let's let's switch this to actually be uh integers. How about that? Okay. I switch this to be integer so I can replicate this error. Of course, you know, the beauty about errors is you make them at the worst times so when you try to replicate them, they don't appear, right? Let's try that, okay? So first let's compare, is, is 42 equal to 52? No, it's not. Of course, I could switch this to say not equal to 52, and in this case, it's true because they're not equal, okay? So let's say I was trying to do equal, but I go ahead and put in one equal sign instead of two. All right, it compiled, yay. So I can show you the error now. So here's the thing. You go ahead, you're typing code. You intended to compare C1 and C2. Of course, the way you would do that is with, with the two equal signs. If you'd done that, then you would have gotten a zero, okay? You would have gotten a zero. But because you put one equal sign, you get a one. And you're pulling your hair all night. Why is it telling me, why is the computer telling me that 42 is equal to 52? And right now, this is, you're, you're, you're like, well, you know, there's a missing equal sign. Yeah, sure. Because I'm making a point because there's like 13 lines of code. But I guarantee you, like I could bet you money right now, that in, if you're a CS major, that you will have an error like this, as trivial as this, where you put one equal sign instead of two or vice versa. Well, actually, typically it's like this. Instead of two, you put one, and you will spend at least half an hour 
just trying to figure it out and then you will find it and then you will just like quietly be angry at yourself for a little while and then it'll pass and there's nothing to learn there because like you know that it's, you're not supposed to do that but we just make mistakes it's, it's just a typo and this is a very good example of a semantic error because both are perfectly valid c++ statements in this case i am comparing two booleans i'm comparing two integers and, and depending on the, if they're equal or not i'm storing the value as a boolean in this one it's a little bit weirder i'm assigning c2 to c1 so i'm copying the value of 55 into 42 so i'm replacing 42 with 55 and then i'm actually copying 55 into bool into b but b is a boolean so as i said anything that's not a zero it just sets it to true and so that's why we're getting true out of that some programming languages have gone to the point where they don't even let you do this inside of an if statement because it's very common error and, and you can do the same thing inside an if statement which when i show you in a second just be careful unfortunately there's no way you can avoid it but all just 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 try to be careful because it's something very very tricky to debug here it's super obvious but you'll see that it's not uh, and they already makes those mistakes and don't feel bad it's part of life it's part of programming you know you give a man a program and uh make him suffer for a day teach him how to program make him suffer for a lifetime that's kind of the, the mentality here okay so all right with that let's go ahead and show you finally after all this time an if statement okay so i'll go ahead and put the definition here so i have to switch back to the ipad so an if statement is a selection structure that allows a program to choose between alternate actions so that's going to be our little y in the row okay the syntax for creating an if statement is if open parentheses and then you have your logical expression in here that's your boolean algebra close parentheses and then typically you want to space it out by going to the next line and then tapping it once have your statement here okay and the semicolon at the end that's the best way now this could all be all potentially in the line like let me let me let me go ahead and put that so it doesn't there we go this could all be in one line potentially so i could do something like if log expression which stands for logical expression statement semicolon you could do that however programming practice you want to do it this way furthermore if your statement is more than one line of code and i'll show you examples of that then you want to use the curly brackets so if you have more than one line of code you can do if law expression curly bracket and you can see when i type in the curly bracket the uh the ide automatically puts the closing one for me that's to save me time press enter and even it spaced it for me it it, it moved my 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 cursor forward and i can start typing here statement see that's the id helping you code faster however don't get lazy and because you've got to know these things for the test and you don't have an id in the test so uh, make sure you actually know that that's why this is happening all right there's more to the if statement but that's what we're gonna talk about for now okay so let's uh let's go ahead and go back to our example from the lecture stuff and kind of code it out so let me get rid of these and let me first create my variables so we have is 9 a.m we have um i got i gotta remember actually you know we could do the one with the wash clothes watch tv but actually here let's just nah we'll we'll do first the uh the 9 a.m. one and then and then we'll go to the other one okay baby steps so I'm a C, uh, CS135 student is CS135 student I guess a, a naming convention that's popular is to put the word is in front of a boolean to, to make it obvious that it's a boolean is weekends okay so that's the three booleans that we got all right and of course the answer but the answer we're not going to need to store anywhere because we're going to use it inside the if statement so it's okay it's all good all right 
So let's go ahead and put our if statement. So our illogical expression here is going to be, and some people like to space it out this way, is going to be the combination of that. So we said is 9 a.m. and we can also use ampersand uh, ampersand is CS135 student and it's not the weekend. So in this case, not with the exclamation point is weekend. Okay, so now I'm saying if it's 9 a.m. and it's I'm a student and it's not the weekend, then I want to go ahead and watch the video lecture. So I'm just going to put inside of here, see out, watch video lecture. Okay. And if, I, if not, then it's not going to tell me to watch the lecture. It's not going to do anything. Okay. And before that, I'm going to say a message that says good morning. Because I always want to print out good morning. And at the end of the program, I'm also going to print out a message saying have a nice day. Okay. All right. So uh, I, as it is right now, though, I don't have anything for these. But let's make it interactive. Let's make the user enter whether it's 9 a.m., whether they're a student, and whether it's the weekend or not. So for that, um, because I want to save time, I'm going to just kind of put some quick prompts saying, is it 9 a.m.? Like that. And then I can go ahead and store into 9 a.m. Then I can say, are you student? And then I can say, CN is CS135 student. And then finally, is it the weekend? Is weekend. And then I think I want to put some line fits here to make it nicely spaced out like that. Okay. All right. So let's see if it compiles. Yeah, it compiles. Good. Yeah. Now we don't have it very nicely set, so we ought to manually put in one or zero for true or false. That's okay. We'll do that for now. So is it 9 a.m.? I'm going to say yes by putting a 1. Am I a student? I'm going to say yes by putting a 1. Is it the weekend? I'm going to say no by putting a 0. It tells me to watch the video lecture and it tells me to have a nice day. Okay, let's run it again. This time, I'm going to say it's 9 a.m. Yes. I'm going to say that I'm a student. Yes. However, I'm going to say it's also the weekend. So I'm going to put yes. In this case, it tells me to have a nice day, but notice it does not tell me to watch the video lecture. So again, this time let's go ahead and put that it's not 9 a.m. I'm going to say that I'm a student, and I'm going to say that it's not the weekend. Yet again, it tells me just have a nice day. So only if it's 9 a.m., if I'm a student, and if it's not the weekend, does it tell me to watch the video lecture. Now you have seen what an if statement is capable of doing. It allows you to have that choice in your program. Okay? So, what if... In addition to this, I would like it to give me a message when you don't watch the lecture saying, no lecture today. Okay, for that, you know, because right now an if statement evaluates, uh, if the expression here evaluates to true, then it executes what's inside of the body of the if statement. So this here, this right here, it only gets executed when this, uh, this evaluates to true, okay? However, what if I want to run some piece of code when it does not have a lecture true? So basically, a message saying, no lecture today, all right? So I only want that message to print when there's no lecture, right? So I basically print one or the other. For that, I use the else clause in an if statement. So the else clause in an if statement allows me to have a alternative statement run when when um, 
when the thing evaluates to false. So if you go back here to uh, a little thing right here, you know, we did so far the purple one, but now I want to do the red one, which is execute a statement when the thing evaluates to false. So here we have on the top, the, the arrow coming down, so right here, this is the uh, good morning message. And this is the have nice day message, which are ones that print regardless of what happens. But the purple one is the uh, watch lecture one. Now we want to do the red one that says no lecture today. Okay, so that's what we're trying to achieve here. So, okay. The syntax, I guess I'll add it into our syntax for this, is you put the keyword else, and yet again, you can just put a statement like that. However, uh, you can also go ahead and use curly brackets. So your if statement can look like this, log expression, here, let me do it without colors. If a, for example, blah, else, and then blah. So here's a statement. Statement, and then not the log expression. Okay. And maybe for this, I'm going to go ahead and use uh, this kind of commenting so it looks nicer. Okay, so this would be an if else statement. And the else clause only gets executed when the logical expression evaluates to false. Where, so basically, I'll put it as a comment here. This runs when log expression is true. This runs when log expression is false. So this is going to be the red one and the blue one, okay, or the purple one. The, the, this is the purple one. This is the red one. So in our case, this will say something like, yay, no lecture today. And there you go. If we run this again, you'll see that that's what it's going to do. Ah, hold on. I got to recompile it. Again, we still haven't uh, made it nice, so we still got to put in one or zeros, uh, which is okay. So is it 9 a.m.? Yes. Am I a student? Yes. Is it the weekend? Yes. In this case, it says, yay, no lecture today. Is it 9 a.m.? Nah. Am I a student? Nah. Is it the weekend? Nah. Well, no lecture today. Okay. Uh, is it 9 a.m.? Yes. Am I a student? Yes. Is it the weekend? No. Watch video lecture today or watch video lecture, okay? So now you know how to do uh, statements based on whether something is true or false. Uh, this is called the if else, or it's also called the if then else. And this basic but very important concept in programming is available in pretty much all programming languages. Anyone that you can think of, it's available. Most of them have the similar syntax of having something like an if in there, okay? Uh, some of them use the word then as well, but most have the keyword if and else. Finally, from there, uh, we also have a compound if statement where you can ask follow-up questions. So, an example of that would be, suppose you want to ask um, a follow-up question like, like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, let's do this. So, let's do the, let's do the, um, the one with the washing clothes and missing parents example. Yeah, let's do that one, okay? So let's go ahead and I'll probably, uh, because this is kind of getting uh, big, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make another program here. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and clean it up. We'll leave the have nice day. And then 
there we go and then this is visible maybe okay now it's visible cool. let's save that let's try to run it just to make sure it compiles uh, okay all right we're ready so Okay, so we're trying to do the whole uh, wash clothes, wash TV, and wash your parents. And we agree that we have four variables. We have Boolean C, which I guess we better could be better names. Uh, clothes dirty. We have bool, have free time, bool, has homework, bool, Miss parents. Okay. Um, we can do the same prompting thing here, but I think I'll save some some time by just uh, manually putting them here. Okay. But of course, if I'm manually putting them in, why have this in the first place? So ideally, you want it to be interactive. So. But uh, yeah. Okay. So for now, we'll just say clothes are dirty. I have. I'll just set them all to true for now. Then we'll explore. Okay. So yep. Yeah. All right. So we had our logic that was C and F and M for wash clothes. So let's go ahead and just first of all add an if statement for whether we should wash clothes or not. Okay. So for washing clothes, we said that clothing, free time, both have to be true and missing parents has to be false okay so we said basically clothes dirty and free time hot free time and not miss parents okay and in that case we said wash clothes all right otherwise here's the thing so you have two choices here now, right? You have the choice of watching TV or visiting parents. But the else clause, as it is now, only lets you run one thing. So you, if you're not watching clothes, then you got to do this. But within this, you want to have another choice. You need to still figure out whether you're going to watch TV or visit parents, right? So there are two solutions. First, I'm going to show you the nested solution. And then I'm going to show you the else if clause, okay? Nested solution is... You can nest if statements inside of each other. So like if statement inception per se. So I can I can put the same logic of an if statement inside another one, inside another one, inside another one. So what that means is I know this about if I have if, if I have to wash clothes, then I'm gonna do that. Okay? But now in here, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna put in an, another if statement. So here let me put the body first and then fill it in and run it in there, okay? And it has its own curly brackets and its own if and else clause. And this only runs if the, fir if, if the first one evaluates to false. So this is if statement inception, okay? So in this if statement inception, I can go ahead now and ask uh, if I wanna watch TV. So I want this to see out, watch TV. So what I have to ask is we said, F and not C and not H and not M. So we said free time. So have free time and no dirty clothes. So node clothes dirty and uh, no homework. So no has homework and and notice that now I'm using the word and, and before I was using the ampersand, both work. In fact, I'll, I, I kind of just uh, switch it back and forth here. Don't do that. Stick to one. Just, I'm trying to give you more than one option here. And not miss parents. Come on. There we go. Okay. And, there, and so now, if all of these are going to be, if, if this statement about us is true, then I watch TV. What if it doesn't? Does that automatically mean that I watch that I that I go visit parents? Um, maybe 
In fact, is there any other possible way? I don't know. Um, the way that we have it now, it doesn't matter whether your clothes are dirty or not. Um, however, if you do it this way, let's see, not miss parents. So if we do that, just could we automatically deduce? This is where you're, you gotta think logic. Could we deduce that if you're not gonna watch clothes and watch TV, that you're gonna watch parents, or I mean, sorry, you're gonna visit parents, or is there a possibility where you can't do any of the three options? That's what I'm trying to see. Uh, if you don't have free time, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's say you don't miss your parents, but you also don't have free time. No, but you have to have free time. And you have to have no homework. But if you, if you have, or miss parents. Okay, so what if you don't miss your parents? And you have free time and you have homework. You have free time and you have homework. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's that situation. So let me write it down. So the way that we have it right here is for the, uh, for the parents, we have free time and no homework and miss them, right? I propose the following scenario. You do not miss parents. You do not have free time, or sorry, you, you, uh, you, you, you have free time, you have free time, you do not have homework, okay? If such a scenario happens, uh, we basically are not gonna watch TV, right? We're not gonna watch TV because we don't have free time. So you, or sorry, you do not have homework. Ah, okay, so let's, okay, let's go with that one. So if you, if you, if you do not have homework, then this would evaluate to true this would evaluate to true. This would evaluate to true. And then the close are not that. Okay, so let's let's flip it around. So let's say you do not have free time. You do have homework. How about that? If you have homework, then this is going to evaluate to false, which means you're not gonna watch TV. However, you also should not go to parents. Yeah, yeah, okay, perfect, 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 yeah. So in this scenario right here, where you don't miss your parents, you do not have free time, and you do, you, you do have homework, you're not supposed to watch TV, but you're also not supposed to watch your parents. So there's that possibility right there. So because of that possibility right there, you cannot just automatically go to parents. So what this means for you is, you can't just put this in the else clause. Okay, you have to put another if statement inside of here to check that. I'll leave it as a comment. Because otherwise, you may end up with a situation where, in fact, we'll even put it as an else here and saying, uh, see how can't do anything like that because there's a situation that we haven't considered where you can't wash clothes you can't watch TV and you can't watch your and you can't visit your parents so that there is that combination that, that we basically found and it was a tricky one but it's a, it happens to be there is that is that what we want or do we always want to be able to do one thing you know that's something you got to consider see this is the part where logic can get tricky like it can it can stumble you when you got to think about this very carefully so you don't make mistakes okay so let's go ahead and throw in the checks to see whether we can go ahead and visit parents those checks are going to be uh you have free time and no homework And, or, actually, or, Miss Parents. Uh. Oh, did you notice how that just had a, you can back, back up the video later. Notice I had an underscore in there. That's because it was a system variable. So there's a hint on how you're not supposed to use underscores, even though you can, because they're reserved for system variables. So there you go. 
Now we have nested if statements where it's going to check the inner, the outer one first. And if this is false, then it's going to check this one. And if this is false, then it's going to check this one. And if all three happen to be false, then you're going to print this out. So there's a lot of combinations here of what can happen. Uh, if you want me to draw what that basically looks like in the control flow, it's kind of like this. Let me, uh, let me have it open there so I can see what's happening. So we're coming in with the code and we, we hit the first if statement. And uh, if it evaluates to true, so we'll say true is on this side, then you're gonna do the wash clothes part and you're done. However, over here, this is gonna go into an entire different if statement. That's gonna be the second one, the one for watching TV. And if that evaluates to true, then you do watch TV. If it evaluates to false, however, so this is the false branch. Yes, we call that a branch because it looks like a tree. We hit a third if statement. If it goes to the true branch here, it says to visit parents. If it goes to the false branch here, then it says we can't do anything. Regardless of where you go in all of those branches, all these branches are going to meet up again here. And then you're going to have the have a nice day. Okay? So that is how the control flow sequence looks like now for, uh, for these if statements. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. Um, let's actually throw in that weird combination that we had before and see if the logic that I was saying was right. So miss parents is gonna be set to false because we don't miss the parents in this one. Uh, we're gonna say we do not have free time. And we're gonna say that we do have homework. And well, okay, we'll leave it to, to close dirty first because that we'll, we'll see what happens, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and run that. It says I can't do anything, perfect. So it actually went in to, uh, to that one automatically. That's pretty cool because uh, clothes were dirty. However, we have free time. I'm oh, sorry, we don't have free time. And uh, that automatically right there, you don't even have to keep going. The fact that you don't have free time means you can't, it doesn't matter what happens with the missing parents part. This has already evaluated or false. And that actually brings up a very good point. That I'm glad I didn't forget. C++ has what's known as short circuit evaluation. Okay, let me write that down. C++ has short circuit evaluation. Evaluation. Okay. What does that mean? What that means is C++ is a lazy language per se. When it's looking at a Boolean expression, it does, you know, it, it, it has to compute that by going through each variable and, and doing the and and the ors and going left and right and doing all of that stuff, right? Well, here's the thing. If you have a sequence of, 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 of a Boolean expression that is of the following order, you have something like this, A and B and C, okay? That's what you're evaluating. Remember the truth table. The truth table says that for an end statement to evaluate to true, all three things have to be true, okay? If one of those is false, then this will not evaluate to true, it's impossible. So here's the thing. If I'm looking at this expression and I'm looking at the B, so I go from left to right, I look at the A and the A is true, but then I look at the B and the B is false. Because the B is false at that point, I do not need to look at the C because no matter what the C contains, if B is false, then this will evaluate to false. Because I don't need to see what C contains, then I'm not going to. I'm just going to say, yeah, 
man, this is going to evaluate to false, so I don't need to keep checking. It would be pointless and a waste of time. And it's true, it would be a waste of time because it doesn't matter. It's just, and you remember, you want computers to do things quickly, right? You want them to do it as fast as possible. Well, this is one of the ways that you can achieve that by speeding things up like this. However, as we uh, go on further and you see that that little C there could be a function call or there could be actual operations happening in there. You shouldn't do that, but it's possible. And if you do that, then that may or may not get run. Okay? So just be warned about that. Short circuit evaluation is, is good because it speeds up the code a little bit. But there is that side effect that it's not even going to look at the code. And if that code is actually doing something, which it really shouldn't, but if it is, if it's doing something, then bad things are going to happen. What is an example of it doing something? Nothing prevents me here from having an AND here that says D gets 1. It's bad practice to do that, but it could work. And so now, if, if, if B is false, that D get, gets 1 is never going to be executed, which means that if D had 5 before that, then it's still going to have 5. That's dangerous, because you have no control over that. And, and if you don't plan ahead, then scary things can happen because of that unexpected uh, results to your programs. So anyways, that's the concept of a short circuit evaluation. And in C++, it has it. So therefore, be careful because of that. It's meant to cut time by uh, evaluating things. Now, in the scenario where A, B, C, and D, you know, if they're all true, then it's going to check them all before it can go on, right? So this only really happens if A, B, or C are false, and then it can stop. If it was an OR statement, of course, it doesn't matter because it's possible that later on something is true, right? So this is mostly applying for an AND. However, actually, the, if you had something like this, A or B or C, if A is true and it sees an OR statement next, it knows that no matter what the rest is happening, because A is true and it's an OR, it'll evaluate to true. So yet again, it will just stop working right there. It'll just be like, yep, this is true. That's the answer. I don't need to keep checking. Because it's like if I told you, uh, add the following numbers, and if they're greater than 10, then uh, you just tell me this greater than 10, and you're good to go. So if you're adding like 20 numbers, and by the second number you add, you're already at 15, you can be like, yeah, this is definitely going to be bigger than 10. Because A, the, all the numbers are positive. Let's say, I, let's say I told you that ahead of time. Uh, if all the numbers are positive, and you've added two of them already, and that's more than 10, you can stop counting at that point. Because it doesn't matter. It's a big number, but it's bigger than 10. That's all I needed to know. Why do more work than that? Just do what you're required to do. I'm done, right? So anyways, that's short circuit evaluation for you. Big important concept. But anyways, back to this, you can see that we did not account for a special scenario or where it was this combination, which took us to the can't do anything. So if we didn't have this here, if this wasn't part of the code, then just nothing would get printed out. No option would. But at least now, by having that else in there, it's impossible for any situation to not print anything out. The way that I have it here, if this evaluates to true, then this runs. If this evaluates to true, then this runs. If this evaluates to true, then this runs. If this evaluates to false, this gets checked. Uh, let's say this also gets evaluated to false. Then this gets checked. If this gets also evaluated to false, then this runs. So the way I have it now, I'll scroll down, is uh, you, can't, uh, you can't ever have a situation where nothing will print. Okay? So this is one way of doing this. There's a, now, the nested if else statements, it's okay. You will use it a lot. But sometimes, it's, it, it, it can get a little bit, uh, you know, it can go pretty wide. Notice that each of these is tabbed ones. And it even helps by putting these lines. You want to do that. That's part of the rules of the language that on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the syllabus, on, on how you're supposed to code. You want to do that because it's a good practice, because it makes your code easier to see. When, when I'm looking at code, and I see these tabs right here, it tells me that this is a part of an if statement or other situations where you use curly brackets like loops. It, it, it's, good, it's, it's a good visual indication for me to know that this is the piece of code that gets executed inside of this if statement. If I just went ahead and I'm going to show you what that looks like, I can press shift tab, which will decrease it. If I just do this, this is horrifying to read. This is literally the worst possible thing you can do to a program. You can make it, you can make it completely unreadable. I see this, and I just, I just want to close this program at this point. You know, be glad I'm not grading it, because if I was grading it, I'd give them a big zero and move on with my life. Because that is just unreadable code. 
Do not ever code like that. I've seen people in 302, in CS302 code like that. I have no idea how they got there from 135 doing that. But, you know, it just makes me angry. It, it really does. So uh, don't uh, don't ever do that. And, and I do have on, this, on the rubric to, to, the, to dock you points for not tabbing your code correctly. If you have any questions about how to tab your code, go ahead and ask them on Discord because it's a very, very important thing to read, to understand. Uh, literally, if you want to... There are lots of ways of detecting amateur programmers. Uh, one of them is how they, they space out their code. That is literally one of the ways that you can just automatically detect whether someone is new to programming. And that's okay for you guys because you are new to programming. But as you practice, you want to make sure you, you, you learn good uh, spacing techniques, okay? Uh, can the format function save us? I don't know. There are some some shortcuts to that you can run. Like I know in, in SQL, there in, in my SQL there uh, workbench, like there's a for, format button that will actually space things out nicely. Don't rely on this though. Make sure you learn. You know, make sure it's it's an instinct that you just tap code correctly. Like this helps you a lot. Like literally, you go ahead and put a if statement here, and like you know, as I said, you write a if statement here. You know, it. it, it get that curly bracket going you know you write something else see bam this like auto completes even the curly brackets but i personally don't like this method of the curly brackets like this it's perfectly fine if you commit to it uh, i prefer the one where the curly bracket is following like that but both are perfectly valid methods like this is a one way of spacing out your code where you have else then you got your curly bracket on its own line and your curly bracket on its own line and you got your code in here that's okay i personally like the method where you have the curly bracket on the same line as the else, like that. And still the code is in its own line, okay? Like I said, technically, if your code is only one line of code, like here, you don't need the curly brackets. I don't do that sometimes. Uh, it can be risky though, because here's the thing. Here, here's what, what another uh, kind of mistake can happen. You don't put the curly bracket and you want to add another line. So you tab it out because you're a good programmer. And, uh, you know, you, you go ahead and put your other line. And, again, because you're so used to looking at good code, you see this and you see the tab code and you think that the second C out statement is inside of the else clause when it's not. If you don't put curly brackets, only the next line of code is inside of the else clause. That means that other the, uh, the, the LOL line is actually going to get executed regardless of this if statement goes in or, or not. If you visit parents or you can't do anything, in both situations, it's going to print out the else clause. So better yet, it would be more appropriate to have it here. Uh, if you want to avoid that, if you have curly brackets like that, it's much easier to uh, put that in and put it in and, and like notice that it's actually inside of the if statement, okay? So curly brackets, I think, are at least for new programmers, you always want to just use them. Just commit to doing them. Don't ever code without them. Because frankly, you're probably gonna mess up. You know, you wanna you wanna start. You want to avoid as much problems as possible. So I just stick to that. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Finally, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show you. So I'm gonna comment this out. The other way of doing this, where you don't have to do what's known as nested if statements. Okay. And that is gonna be with the if else clause. The if else clause allows you to ask follow up questions, but not go nested in. So. That's like me asking you a question like, do you like cookies? And you say, no. Uh, well, do you like chicken? You say, no. Well, do you like this? So basically, as long as you don't evaluate your true one of the if statements, you keep asking follow-up questions until at least one of them hits true or you run out of questions. That's how the if else if works. And it can make your code be a little bit nicer in a situation like this. It's literally like, uh, this is the perfect scenario for using it. So while this code works just fine, check this out. We can make this, well, this, let me show you first the syntax for, for if else. You still have your if with your logical expression in there, like that. But then instead of just having your else, which you will have eventually, or you may have actually, you don't have to, you have an else if with another logical expression. Okay, so now the way that I have this, I ask a question. If it evaluates to true, I run this code and then I'm done. And then I can run some code out here that says like done, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Here's the thing. 
If this is valid to false, then I ask a follow-up question. If that value is true, then I run this code. If it doesn't, then I go ahead and run this right here. So this is sort of my my last hope scenario, run that piece of code. I don't have to have it. I could actually just have something like this where I ask a question and then I ask a follow-up question and then I have no sort of fallback situation. Uh, that's okay as well. But uh, that is known as the if else, if else clause. That's going to be perfect for us. We actually can just modify this very easily by saying if that, else if that, and then we can go ahead and uh, do the same thing here. So we can delete this curly bracket here. Else if that, else that. Get that tab out nicely. And bam. Get rid of the extra curly brackets, although let's not get rid of them. So you can see kind of errors that you can face when you don't have curly brackets. So here, expected declaration before curly bracket token, line 50. So what that is saying is this curly bracket is sort of not matching anything. Like this one matches that, and then this just does not, this actually closed my main function, which means I have just like a random curly bracket that's going out of nowhere. If you have something like that, it just means that you probably have an extra curly bracket. In this case, we actually have, uh, I believe two extras. Yeah, because that one is that. Uh, the ID is nice because when you highlight a, a curly bracket, it highlights the one that it's closing. So it kind of gives you a good hint. Like if I select that, it highlights that. So that means that I'm good. This highlights that, this highlights that, this highlights that. So all my curly brackets are matching. So uh, I'm good to go. So I can go ahead and run this again. Oh, compile. And you can see it did the same thing as before. But compare this piece of code it's just four little if else, if else, else versus this nasty one where we have like this nest, nested levels of stuff. Both are perfectly valid and 100% correct. In, in technically, I could not deduct your points for you doing either one of them. However, you can see how this is just much cleaner. And yes, with code, it's not enough to just code stuff. You wanna, it's like, it's like English. You know, you want your, your it's not, a, it, yes, you can write a paper and express express your opinion uh, in that paper with the most crudest of terms, but you could also write poetry and you could make it artistic. So it's no longer just you expressing your opinion, but you're also sort of doing art, right? You can think of code the same way. Code is art. And it's not just enough to do the code to make it work, but you also want to make it beautiful because a programmer should admire code and be like, wow, this code is beautiful. It's really, really well done. Just like if you were to read this paper by, by like a, by, by, by a really good writer, you, you, you know, yeah, the, the, the topic may be relevant to you and interesting, but if you read something that's just really well written, you're like, wow, this is like beautifully written. Like, like this is poetry to you, right? You can appreciate good writing just like you can appreciate good coding. And you want your code to be good. You want to be proud of the code you do. Now, don't fall into the trap of like, there's a lot of people, uh, especially in the research community, who write code to do these amazing things, but then they don't publish the code because they're ashamed of how crappy it looks because they kind of just, you know, once they got it working, they were just like, oh, yeah, I'm done. It works. I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, no, in those situations, you still want to share it because you want to help science, right? So, yes, you want to make your code beautiful, but not at the cost of like not even ever sharing it, you know? At that point, I say still share it. But at this level, take some pride in the code you do by making it look good. And in this, in, in 135, you're kind of forced to because otherwise you lose points if it doesn't look good, at least for things like tabbing. But also in, in your solutions, you know, you want to make them elegant. You want to make your solutions elegant and beautiful. Like, wow, look how little code I, do, I did to solve such a big problem with such elegant solution, okay? So that's my little preach about that. Hopefully you guys kind of got a feel for the if else if statements. Um, uh, we'll, we, we'll do more practice next time, but now you should be able to do assignment three. So get started on that. And then that way, maybe you guys have questions you can ask me. And then I can do a couple more examples on that. And then we can move on to talking about formatting output. Okay. Uh, any questions? It was really quiet. Hopefully you guys are not scared.
Wait for the extra credit. Yes, on Discord, send me the message on who, of who you are on on Twitch, so that I can, uh, so like, so and who you are on Twitch and then who you are on like real life on campus, so that I know who to give the extra credit to, right? Like, otherwise I don't I don't know who Codex One Two Seven is. Like, I don't know your real name. Don't post your real name here though, because it's it's on YouTube forever, and yeah, you never know. But send it to me on Discord as a private message, uh, and then I'll add, add you up. When do we receive our grades for the first two assignments? That's a great question for the TA <laughs> because the TA is the one that's going to grade it. So uh, just send him a message and ask him when he's going to grade them. Of course, I, I will pressure him to grade them as soon as possible. But, you know, it's 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 his job. So, you know, and, and I can't just force him to grade them the next day. You know, he has a certain buffer of time. But, you know... It, I will try to make him grade things consistently within a two week range. So if the assignment was turning yesterday, you should have your grade before two weeks. Now, that's what I usually do in the regular semester. In the summer, I, I understand that it's more compressed. So I'll try to, I'll see if we can get them done faster than that. So uh, no, no, I don't know, but maximum two weeks for sure. But definitely send him a message and pressure him. <laughs> I'll do the same. All right. Anything else? If not, then I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll be around on Discord. Uh, I definitely feel like everything was more quiet so in the morning. So I don't know why you guys all switched to the morning. And then I don't know how many people were actually here, but I just have a feeling like it was quieter. But all right, then. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, refresh yourselves. Check that link I said on the Boolean. George Bull. Practice some myth statements. And... Uh, Ask questions on Discord. Ask them in public chat and everybody can help out, all right? See you guys tomorrow. Have a good day.